I'll read uh, a little bio. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so Dr. Ann Lutzen von Lutzen is a Norwegian artist and designer working as a letterpress printer in the expanded field. Knudsen works multidisciplinarily at the intersection between graphic design, art, research, and dissemination. She exhibits, presents, and teaches internationally, and her work often takes form as installations and artist works. Knudsen has a special interest in self-taught women on the distaff side of print history, and is currently working on graphic adaptations of the works Virginia Woolf wrote, typeset, and self-published between 1917 and 1930. In 2019, Knudsen defended her PhD on Virginia Woolf's work as a typesetter and self-publisher, and its impact on Woolf's practice as a writer. Knudsen has worked, won several awards for this work. She owns and works for her private letterpress studio in Oslo, and is currently associate professor in graphic design at the Oslo National Academy of the Arts. Thanks for joining us today, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to present uh, at this conference this year. Uh, again, uh, from home or from my print shop. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't be together in person, but hopefully next year. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you and uh, go through um, my uh, presentation. Well, so, can you all see? It's good? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amy, for the introduction. Um, in this keynote, um, I'm going to present my work on being ill, a letterpress printed COVID-19 diary. Uh, my work on Virginia Woolf is read through the lens of my practice as an artistic researcher and letterpress printer, uh, which places the art practice at the center. And in this presentation, I will also talk about how my research uh, directly has influenced my teaching and how Virginia Woolf's writing can be utilized as a creative tool in education of graphic design and illustration. Uh, but first, I want to say a few words about uh, where my work comes from uh, and how it keeps turning and making new trails. I discovered Virginia Woolf, uh, as you may know, uh, when doing an artistic PhD in graphic design, focusing on Norwegian crafts traditions. When I learned that Virginia Woolf was a self-taught letterpress printer, as I was, I started wondering if my legacy as a self-taught female printer came from a different angle than the industrial one. Virginia Woolf, as you know, uh, bought uh, her printing press in March 1917, together with Leonard Woolf. And this hobby uh, quickly turned into a huge publishing house that still lives on today. So my research went from being about the technology itself to looking at how Virginia Woolf's practice as a printer was crucial for developing her style and publish on her own terms, and also how the form influenced the content. There are three works she's written, typeset, printed and published herself, The Mark on the Wall, Kew Gardens and On Being Ill, and these works has been my artistic research objects since 2016. I did my PhD on the mark on the wall from two stories, uh, the first pamphlet they published in 1917. And this is the first text she wrote, typeset, printed, bound and published herself, and is in all its aspects, uh, a product of an author deeply involved in the becoming of the book. And uh, Wolf also um, repeatedly urges women not only to get a room of your own, but also a printing press of your own, which she says several times in three guineas. And this inspired me to set up my own print shop in the basement of my house, where I'm sitting right now, and claim ownership of every aspect of my practice as a printer. I research Wolf through long and straining printing processes. It is just as much about investigations of time 
to see what happens with the body and how my thoughts are affected by working with a relatively monotonous task that demands focus for a long period of time. I want to convey to people outside the printing community what it requires to typeset, how the words affects your whole body by flipping the whole relationship between typesetting and reading in relation to the body, from something intimate and tangible to something big and fragmented. The format and limitations is the printing press, the type, the words, the sheets, and the room. And what happens if you break up an entire text, doing a piecemeal examination of the text as form and fragments, where each print can be read as a separate image and as a part of a whole. I finished my work on the mark on the wall in January 2019 and immediately started forging another wolf adaptation. I had a clear goal in sight that started with a vague dream after the conference in 2017 that was devoted to the Hogarth Press to present a monumental adaptation at a future international Virginia Woolf conference. However, installing the mark on the wall requires a very, very large room. And it was also made as a site specific work uh, made for a room measuring 30 times eight times four length meters. Uh, but it's still possible to install other places because I have four more editions of this work. So in October 2019, I contacted Benjamin Hagen, who was very encouraging and enthusiastic when I presented my ideas. And then I started applying for grants to do another adaptation, this time of Kew Gardens. It would be just as monumental but I planned a more organic structure in order to be able to install it more flexibly and also finding it logic, taking that Kew Gardens evolves around an oval shaped flower bed and not marks on walls. Come the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, my applications proved successful and I knew I had the time and the money to be able to actually go through with my plans. And I had my whole year lined up and I was uh, about to start searching for the right kind of paper and schedule the printing. I had uh, registered um, that the world was talking of a new pandemic, but uh, I thought this was uh, very overrated and hysterical and I didn't pay that much attention to it because I was too busy uh, making my plans. On March 12, 2020, Norway locked down. Everything was shut down. Work stopped and the kindergarten closed. Luckily, I had a part-time job and all of my energy went into handling all this immediate crisis that we had to deal with. And all my artistic plans fell apart. All my exhibitions were canceled. And instead I was stuck with fear and confusion. And I felt like time itself had stopped. Just before COVID hit, I had finished Blue and Green, a transition from the Mark on the Wall adaptations, uh, from the Mark on the Wall adaptation over to Kew Gardens, experimenting with colors because writing and painting has much, have much to tell each other, as Wolf wrote. And learning newsprint wasn't the right paper for Kew Gardens. Blue and Green was also made for the exhibition imprints at Shandy Hall uh, in the UK, which was part of the new modernist editing project at Glasgow School of Art and Glasgow University by Edwin Pickstone, Bryony Randall and Jane Hislop, which of course also was postponed uh, until 2021. So with the current situation, I knew doing the physically and mentally demanding work on Kew Gardens would be too much to take on. I had to make the difficult choice of postponing until a future I didn't know. And I have to mention that all this postponing for creatives living partially off grants for exhibition also blocks the possibilities for new projects. Having to keep several post projects warm felt like dragging a dead horse along. But there's no use in lying down and crying. And I think one of the best things of being trained as a designer is that the glass is always half full. We're always looking to use any situation constructively. Obstacles and chaos may produce work that was not intended, but in retrospect make perfect sense like it was made to be so. So I chose to focus on what could be controlled 
And like so many times before, it was like Virginia Woolf provided me with just the right stuff at just the right time, which helped me to understand and work through this difficult situation. A few days into lockdown, I picked up the essay on being ill, written in the wake of the Spanish flu in 1925, typeset and printed by Virginia Woolf in 1930. I had planned to work on, on being ill anyway, but way later down the line. But with its acute relevance, life wanted it differently. And in this, in this sentence, there it was, my quarantine project. Quote, we break off a line or two and let them open in the depths of the mind, spread their wings, swim like colored fish in green waters. March 23rd, 2020, sentence number one. Considering how common illness is, how tremendous the spiritual change it brings, how astonishing when the lights of health go down, the undiscovered countries that are then disclosed, what wastes and deserts of the soul a slight attack of influenza brings to light, what precipices and lawns sprinkled with bright flowers a little rise of temperature reveals, what ancient and obdurate oaks are uprooted in us in the act of sickness, how we go down into the pit of death and feel the waters of annihilation close above us, heads close above our heads, and wake thinking to ourselves to find ourselves in the presence of the angels and the harpers when we have a tooth out and come to the surface in the dentist armchair and confuses, rinse the mouth, rinse the mouth with the greetings of the deity stooping from the floor of heaven to welcome us. When we think of this and infinitely, not mo infinitely more, as we are so frequently forced to think of it, it becomes strange indeed that illness has not taken its place with love battle and jealousy among the prime themes of literature. I was planning to do a project on Kew Gardens next, but due to COVID-19, it has fallen apart and I've cast my eyes upon on being ill, the third and last of Wolf's own works, which she printed and published in 1930. The story is about the consequences of illness, loneliness, isolation and vulnerability. But it also points out that when we're forced to stop and slow down, we may notice the beauty in the small details of the world around us and that our everyday, ordinary life is what we miss the most. I like being alone working and I'm blessed with a workshop at home, but we have a four-year-old at home too. So I'm structuring a quarantine project that works with the circumstances. One sentence every day, in addition of 20, from on being ill, until we can go back to normal. I hope I will not make it through as we're counting about 140 sentences and the paper is restricted to leftovers from my stock. And I'm obliged to post today's sentence on Instagram and offer a collective slow reading. March 29th, sentence number seven. But of all this daily drama of the body, there is no record. I'm through week one. It's nice to have a ritual, a record of the days. Going through this story sentence by sentence, it becomes clear that Wolf treated the text as something material, something tactile, where the thoughts and words are matter. Although letterpress is highly rational, concrete and mathematical, the words are not. April 1st, sentence number 10. Those great wars which it wages by itself, with a mind a slave to it, in the solitude of the bedroom against the assault of fever or the oncome of melancholia, are neglected. Hermione Lee wrote in The Guardian, uh, December 18th, 2004. The story of the body's life and the part the body has to play in our lives is one of Virginia Woolf's great subjects. Far from being an ethereal, chill, disembodied writer, she is always transforming thoughts and feelings and ideas into bodily metaphors. She writes with acute, often extremely troubling precision about the body, about how the body mediates and controls our life stories. April 4th, sentence number 13. Short of these, this, mon this monster, the body, this miracle, 
its pain will soon make us taper into mysticism or rise with rapid beats of the wings into the raptures of transcendentalism. I like Gaudi's full stops. They're like little diamonds. I've been very into full stops for some years now. Full stops are life, a sign telling us to draw breath, to pause for a shorter or longer while. And if this time was a glyph, uh, I guess it's a full stop and a break. And it might be a good time to reflect on how to continue. There will always be a new sentence and a new beginning. April 5th, sentence number 14. All day, all night, the body intervenes, blunts or sharpens, colors or discolors, turns to wax in the warmth of June, hardens to tallow in the murk of February. Two weeks down, it feels like an instant and forever at the same time. I have no thoughts beyond Easter. Until we have new guidelines from the government for the coming weeks, it feels like waiting for a bus in the cold. It's this strange time perspective that I experience Wolf has captured so beautifully in this short story. Funny word even, short story. It certainly is not to me. April 6th, sentence number 15. Finally, among the drawbacks of illness as mathematical literature, there is the poverty of the language. As a practitioner, maker, designer, artist, whatever you call it, I very much relate to this problem with finding words. The words to describe what's happening when we are making or are in the flow, or what I heard someone once call the magic. In 1937, as you know, there was a series of lectures on BBC by the word, title words fail me. One of these was craftsmanship. It is a brilliant essay about the problem with words, their cunningness, shortcomings, but also possibilities. And this essay made me accept that the words do fail. They will never express fully what we experience in our bodies and imagination. But for some things, they're the best we've got. And it's worthwhile trying to make them your allies. April 12th, sentence number 22, 21. Probably it will be something laughable. Every time people do something unconventional with something tied to conventions, there will always be people feeling the urge to tell you what you are doing wrong and how you ought to be doing things, instead of asking why you are unconventional in the first place. A reader criticized the printing of On Being Ill, and Virginia Woolf replied, All I have to urge in excuse is that printing is a hobby carried on in the basement of a London house, that as amateurs all instructions in the art was denied us, that we have picked up what we know for ourselves, that we practice printing in the intervals of lives that are otherwise engaged." End quote. What is interesting is what being unconventional did for her, to put it in her own words, to change style at will and being the only woman in England free to write what she likes. <clears throat> April 17th, sentence number 26. I am in bed, I'm in bed with influenza, he says, and actually complains that he gets no sympathy. Alison Mayo writes in Spanish Flu and the Depiction of Disease. Wolf wrote in a diary on October 20th, 1918. We are in the midst of a plague unmatched since the Black Death. And Megan O'Grady writes in What Can We Learn from the Art of Pandemic Past? Wolf who had witnessed the devastation of the 1918 flu pandemic that killed millions worldwide, made the title a heroine of her 1925 no novel, Mrs. Dalloway, an influenza survivor, embracing life and togetherness with flowers and friendship and a dinner party. After so much trauma, Wolf understood what it meant, this coming together of shell-shocked survivors of the 20th century. <clears throat> April 24th, sentence number 32. Sympathy nowadays is dispensed chiefly by the laggards and failures, women for the most part, in whom the obsolete exists so strangely side by side with anarchy and newness, who, having dropped out of the race, have no time to spend upon fantastic and 
fantastic and unprofitable excursions. CL, for example, who sitting by the stale sick room fire builds up with touches at one sober and imaginative. The nursery fender, the loaf, the lamp, barrel organs in the street, and all the simple old wives' tales and pinafores and escapades. AR, the rash, the magnanimous, who, if you fancied a giant tortoise to solace you, or a therobo to cheer you, would ransack the markets of London and procure them somehow, wrapped in paper, before the end of the day. The frivolous KT, dressed in silks and feathers, painted and powdered, which takes time too, as if for a banquet of kings and queens, spends her whole brightness in the silks and feathers, painted and powdered, which takes time too, as if for a banquet of kings and queens, who spend her whole bright, sorry, <laughs> Uh, brightness in the gloom of the sick room and makes the medicine bottles ring and the flames shoot up with her gossip and mimicry. April 29th, sentence number 37. We do not know our own souls and let alone the souls of others. This sentence is often quoted. Maybe it's because it's so true. What is also true is my type is getting worn. This is the type case I've used the most over the years. Purists would criticize using worn type. And I get it. But this project is about the build and the thinking, the forgetting and then rediscovering, and to look again at things in a different light and time. That is why I like how the wear and tear and imperfections are reminding me that words must be chosen carefully and that one day I've spent them all. May 30th, sentence number 69. It is in their indifference that they are comforting. Today was supposed to be our wedding day. The weather is annoyingly great and the air smell of lilacs. And though it is sad that none of us really gets to celebrate and hug friends and family this year, love is still love and I can't be anything but thankful for getting to spend my every days with this genuinely generous and kind person who makes me better, stronger and happy and not forgetting he built me this freaking print shop. June 3rd, sentence number 72. Mrs. Jones catches her train. And this was the day after the Black Lives Matter exploded. And I really felt bad posting these random sentences as they felt like at the moment. Like Mrs. Jones here, I have to keep going, but try and choose the right train to catch. I think it's difficult to face that my curriculum is in fact very, very white. And like working on the absence of women, I know it's my job to do the work on digging up diversity and choose again and again my influences. They're there, it is just I who know too little. Being a fan of printers against the current, I've been keeping this in my archive, saving it for a later project, but it's no time like the present. Ruth Ellis, born in Springfield in 1899, best known as an LGBTQ plus activist, but also a letterpress printer. She was a pioneer in many ways. She came out as a lesbian in the age of 16, she graduated from high school at a time where fewer than 7% of African-Americans held high school diplomas. And in 1937, she became the first American woman to own a printing business in Detroit. She and her partner, Cecily and Babe Franklin, became advocates for the gay and black communities, offering housing to black youth immigrant, migrants to Detroit from the South and financial assistance uh, to black college students. Ellis and Franklin also turned their home into uh, a gathering place for queer black men and women who were unwelcome at white clubs and bars. Ellis' activism continued until her death in 2000 at the age of 100. In 1999, the Ruth Ellis Center opened in Detroit to provide shelter for LGBTQ plus youth experiencing homelessness. <clears throat> June 28th, sentence number 97. Left to ourselves, we can but trifle with it. Imagine papes in heaven. 
a bumper at little interviews with celebrated people on thefts of time, soon falling into gossip about such of our friends as have stayed in hell, or worse still revert again to earth and choose, since there is no harm in choosing, to live over and over, now as man, now as woman, as sea captain, court lady, emperor, farmer's wife, in splendid cities and on remote malls, in Tehran and Tunbridge Wells, at the times of Pericles or Arthur, Chalamanj or George IV, to live and live, till we have lived out those embryo lives which attend about us in early youth and been consumed by the tyrannical eye, who has conquered so far as this world is concerned, but shall not, if wishing can alter it, usurp heaven too, and condemn us, who have played our parts here as William or Amelia, to remain William or Amelia forever. I'm amazed that in this one sentence, there is potential of volume upon volume of stories. I return to the economics of words in typesetting. The fact that you're bound to doing that manual labor yourself, you know the physical space is limited. And this tells me something about poetry, which I found to be closely related to typesetting, even though I've never been really into poetry as a reader. I'm a very impatient armchair reader, binging on sentences. But when I spend such an amount of time and concentration on just one line, rebuilding one sentence at a time, it reveals layers and reflections and stories I would have never seen if I just rushed through the pages. Wolf has taught me many things, and one I really appreciate is enjoying a really well-crafted line of type and giving it the attention the writer probably used shaping it. August 8th, sentence number 136. We have to remind ourselves that there is such a thing as atmosphere, that the masters themselves often keep us waiting intolerably while they prepare our minds for whatever it may be, the surprise or the lack of surprise. Seems the intolerable wait for the pandemic to pass is going to outlive this project by far, which I, in my naivety, hoped would not happen. It is as it is, so I choose to be excited about the work planned for this autumn and not letting this pandemic prevent me from appreciating life's little things, like mornings, enjoying the intoxicated smell of ink and fresh coffee and a really great sentence. August 14th, sentence number 142. For life then was not the life of Charlotte and Louisa. I've been thinking about these sentences telling the tale about Charlotte and Louisa. For a time, I thought it was a strange way to end as we're on the last page now. But I wonder if Wolf is somehow comparing being a woman to being ill. In both cases, chained to the house and bound to stay inside, living by the grace of others. Being a woman was, and some places still is, like living a whole life in quarantine, with rules made to keep you inside. In 2007, uh, when going to uh, Aina Granum Art School, I covered a bedsheet with embroidered text. Uh, and it's funny that Nancy Kuhner writes in these were the hours, quote, in all, I thought hand setting was like sewing, one stitch at a time, one must like doing either to attain proficiency, end quote. Anyways, it was in short about my grandmother who struggled with mental health issues. My grand did not have the luxury of having an education or becoming a nurse like she dreamt of. She was destined to be a housewife. But I remember her being kind and generous and great at making tapestries and knitting. I've been fortunate with my mental health, probably because possibilities have been open to me. I'd forgotten about this embroidery and unfortunately it was lost a long time ago. But I wonder what would my mental health have been like if I was born in another place and time where being a woman was more like being born ill unable to make decisions for oneself, living like a bird in a cage. August 21st, sentence number 149. 
thousands of notebooks were filled with pen and ink drawings of an evening. And then the carpenter stretched sheets for her and she designed frescoes for schoolrooms, had live sheep in her bedroom, draped gamekeepers in blankets, painted holy families in abundance until the great Watts exclaimed that Hare was Titsin's peer and Raphael's master. This sentence makes me think of my own sister, who is a visual artist. Growing up, I was so impressed and proud of her skills at drawing and painting. My whole childhood, she inspired me to practice for hours and hours in my room to improve my skills. And when she started arts and crafts in high school, I used to sneak into her room and go through her portfolio and study her work when she wasn't there. I just can wait until I could start high school and learn about colors and techniques and get to draw for homework. And then she got accepted to the Art Academy in Bergen at 19. And I traveled to visit her as often as I could, always excited to see the work she'd made. Years went on and we established our separate practices, but we always followed and supported each other's work. In 2016, when I started researching Virginia Woolf's work as a typesetter, I also discovered her collaborations with her artist sister, Vanessa Bell. I also have an artist sister, so I was inspired to invite Ilva to take part in our first collaboration as professionals. Uh, because we'd made tons of newspaper, cartoons and movies and so on in our childhood, but never when we had grown up. So Ilva illustrated an essay I wrote and called A Printing Press of One's Own in 2017, which is a reflection on Vanessa Bell and Virginia Woolf's relationship as sisters and artists. We continued uh, discussions from here on about rooms of one's own in relation to life work balance and feminism. And during COVID, we made an artist book together where we swapped professions. Ylve wrote the text about why she couldn't make art for five years after becoming a mother of two. And she combined her text with diary entries from the Norwegian poet Haldis Moon Vesos typeset and printed them in my workshop. I was to work in my sister's workshop, but living in another part of the country, the pandemic prevented me from traveling there. Being stuck at home again, it made it crystal clear what rooms of one's own really means. And I think many of us now know how impossible it is to work with kids at home. So I chose to make four liner cuts depicting the views from the windows of mine, my sister's, Haldis Moon Vesos and Virginia Woolf's studios. This is jumping a bit forward in time, but I realized looking back that COVID has in fact been very fruitful to my work. Instability and new perspectives is what feeds art. And this February, my sister and I exhibited together for the very first time in the gallery in the town, the town where we grew up. It also happened to be in the house where our grandfather grew up, in the room he was born, from uh, whom we've inherited some of our artistic talents. August 29th, sentence number 157. She knew it before they told her, and never could Sir John Leslie forget when he ran downstairs the day they buried him. The beauty of the great lady standing by the window see the hearse depart, nor, when he came back again, how the curtain, heavy mid-Victorian, plush perhaps, was all crushed together where she had grasped it in her agony. The end. And the sad end it was, but in a way it sums up what we feel both in illness and in health, to lose our loved ones. Thank you for taking part in this slow reading process and for sharing your reflections on sentences along the way. I'm looking at a stack of paper recording 157 days of a pandemic through this short yet very long and laborious story. Working on these sentences has been much more of an embodied experience than I could have ever imagined. It happens again and again that subjects tend to find me, but maybe it's not so strange at all. Art is entangled with life and its different stages and moves. So when something is not clear or easy, I look for material to help make sense of the world, often through stories and work by others that somehow helps me understand my own feelings and experiences. I have found much comfort in working on this project and much uh, frustration, of course, 
And I hope some of you found some consolation in it too. The reflections, as you may have noticed, are sometimes a little bit out of kilter, not discussing the sentences themselves, but rather blending into work and life and the situation of being in the midst of a pandemic. It was something done on impulse that felt important and above all comforting to be able to pull down a narrative and use the situation as a learning experience because lives move on and we with it, helter skelter like sticks on the stream. Three months later, after finishing, I was asked to teach a course in narrative methods for master students in graphic design and illustration. We all know this was a very difficult time being a student. And I decided to bring on being ill with me into the course to see what could happen in the meeting between them and the narrative I've been holding on to through the beginning of the pandemics. On being ill, the essay was still entangled into my life, and now it was to be entangled into the life of my students. The assignment was to adapt the essay into printed matter. They could stay close or move far, far away from the original, but use it as a mirror for their own pandemic experience. The course was divided into parts, first discussions of the text with translators, comic book artists, book designers, and even performance artists. Second, it was a letterpress workshop and a lithography workshop, uh, and finally a book and box binding workshop. And I can promise that teaching letterpress and making books on Zoom is at absolute odds with each other. Art schools is all about being physically present. Our pedagogics derived from the Bauhaus, where close contact between teachers and students in the workshops is essential. This is why people choose to study in Oslo. And meeting eight students on Zoom for the first time, it was really not bursting with energy. And it was clear that working all alone at home for much longer would be intolerable. So we actually managed to find loopholes and get them back into school. Uh, but there were more like solitudes in the workshop. In a situation like 2020 and 2021, I think it was the very best situation to work on, on being ill. It gave us a tool for analyzing, but more importantly, it was comforting to know that someone had been there before. I think the situation made the work so powerful because they really understood, felt and knew in their bones what Virginia Woolf was talking about. And we asked ourselves how COVID would look in a hundred years time. How will the art from the early 2020s be colored by it? And what has it meant for the students' lives and education? And the results became very personal and, and each very unique. And now I want to present some of the results and the reflections the students made around their work. Arais Misansa based her work directly off the sentence from the essay, here we go alone and like it better so. She wanted to focus on the loneliness of being ill and the separation between body and mind created by it. At the same time, discovering a poem by Andrew Marvel called A Dialogue Between the Body and the Soul, a poem where the soul tells about its problem and the pain it suffers due to the functioning of the body. This dialogue and the idea of having two voices or two forms gave her a clear sense of wanting to present a journey, a traveling of the body and the mind during illness. In her project Ill, Arais has created a book where the body is represented by a red dot, a small nod towards use of punctuation. The soul is represented by a blue shadow and the dot in movement. And the pattern with the two has made was my drawing inspiration from the fever dreams she had as the child. Emil Holmberg Leve uh, thought of the clickety clack of lead hitting metal is like a metronome setting rhythm to the words when making his project. Virginia Woolf's playful dance with words and sentences influenced his decision to write himself. And because he also enjoys writing rap lyrics because he's also a rapper. This became a nice personal entry point to the course. He thought of how on being ill has certain qualities that remind him of lyricism and hip hop, where the subject can change drastically from one line to the next. 
and subsequently lay down rap verses on the spot while laying type. His project, Shuk Flow, which can translate to Sick Flow, is a collection of self written and typeset rap verses about isolation and self pity, bound in a book accompanied by an improvised lithography. Also contemplating the way fever can alter our minds, and Blasunde Mirva used Wolf's essay as a springboard together with Kevin Young and Robin Costlery's poetry for Robert Rauschenberg's 34 illustrations of Dante's Inferno, and made a project where the prince comes at you like a fever dream. She wanted to evoke the state of mind which neither words can express nor reason can explain, where the experience of reading becomes distilled as, wor as words gives out their scent rather than whole passages or chapters. Wanting to mimic the sensation of reading while ill, she printed phrases and words, then combined and recombined them spontaneously on the material. After being affected with the virus in November 2020, Ruth Emilia Rusta related the wolf reflection in the essay uh, to wolf reflection in the essay. Her project uh, POS centers around her positive corona test, subsequent isolation, and the repercussion of that. For her, the feeling and social impact of being an infected person was, hard, was a harder obstacle than the physical symptoms of COVID. Working solely with her hands through letterpress, her letters symbolize something contaminated and infectious. And by putting them in plexiglass, she removed the tactility of letter-pressed words and presented a barrier and protection for people that cause a distance and feeling of isolation. When reading in the essay about how Wolf reflects upon the attention you get from your caregivers, she felt it was a stark contrast to the clinical and rigid handling of herself by the institutions, which made her feel like she might as well have been the virus itself. She in, she in want of sympathy, and she's not getting it from the institutions. As Virginia Woolf writes, sympathy we cannot have. Nicolo Grönier was inspired by a sentence in, in Woolf's essay that indicates sudden failure to participate in everyday life. We cease to be soldiers in the army of the upright, they become deserters. Having personal experience with an unexpected error of the body, resulting in a failure to engage with the ongoing life, he reflected on the individual distinct perspective that arises when the body refused to cooperate. How it often results in being an observer towards the normal life, looking at it from a distance, <coughs> questioning the meaning of being a part of it or not being a part of it, and figuring out how to accept this position and see the value in it. How this different perspective can make way for reflections and insights because of the moment of pause it requires. The project is called Inida Shared Oplevelse and is a self-published manu uh, manuscript or inside yourself experience. Christine Lee Erblund's pr project focuses on the line from the text, we float with the sticks on the stream helter-skelter with the dead leaves on the lawn, irresponsible, disinterested and able, perhaps for the first time for years, to look around, to look up, to look, for example, at the sky. In the beginning of the pandemic, it felt that way, an abrupt halt, a chance to have the time for once, to do other things, to catch up on things, to focus on the lives playing out inside our homes. She saw that her relationship had stagnated, and as the quarantine continued and the newness of the stop faded away, she started longing to get out, not just out of the apartment, but also out of the relationship. The project is a handmade box containing cards, postcards, with text from Wolf and Edward Munch, letterpressed and accompanied by lithography illustrations of her ex-boyfriend in their bedsheet in their living room, looking somewhat cruelly like Pesta reincarnated. Many of the students said that they hadn't thought Virginia Woolf was for them. They had heard it's too difficult and for smarter people. Uh, said the same had I, but at the end of the course, they found that this was not true. On being ill had granted them with a tool for reflection and inspiration 
to find creative power in the hardship that they had experienced. To work on this essay alone, and then later with the students, has been an experience I will look back at with gratitude, despite what the situation cost. I learned so much from bringing it with me, something that I'd been so invested in, into an educational setting. I learned more about on being ill and what it means being ill, reading it with and through my students than only working on my own. And I will take this with me in my future research. Like the mark on the wall, on being ill has been life-changing experiences. And that says a lot about the power of literature and of course, the power of the printing press. COVID is not in the forefront of our lives anymore, but we live with the consequences. It still gets in the way of my plans, which was to exhibit Kew Gardens in Texas at this very moment. I still hope and believe this will be possible and then we can, that we can celebrate physical reunion by walking together amongst the pages of Kew Gardens, hopefully next year. Thank you very much. Thank you all, that was really beautiful. Thank you to all the students for, I see that some of your students are here. Hello. <laughs> That's nice. It was a very, it was very emotional for me to, uh, to see your work and hear you talk about it. Uh, and it may have been for others. So, uh, you may need a few minutes. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and uh, just ask me if you uh, would like to see some of the images again. If you'd like to, you can you can just jump in, or you can uh, raise your hand to the reaction button and go to the top of the screen. Amy, your sound is a little difficult to oh, hear. Okay. Is it still, is it still bad? Seems a little muffled. Is it better now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah oh. much better. Strange. Great. I just needed to plug it in a slightly bit more. Thanks for telling me. Um, yeah, if you if if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, you can uh, use the reaction button. Although people are clearly using the chat button, which was which is great. <laughs> I'm also having uh, the box here, so this is the life size. Of it. It's the inside. It's beautiful. With a very nice marble paper. Melissa, um, you're mentioning you shared this uh, book. Would you like to say anything about it, Melissa Johnson? Sure. So it's called um, Extra Bold. Can you, you know what? I can see I it. Have the, <laughs> can you see it? I have the blur on. So it's. Um, it's Extra Bold, a feminist, inclusive, anti-racist, non-binary female guide, field guide for graphic designers. And Ellen Lupton is one of the main editors, but she kind of sits in the background because she had all these students who ended up writing it with her and putting it mm -hmm. together. Um, and I just, and Ruth Ellis is mentioned in it, which is really nice. So um, I didn't know if you knew about this or your students knew about it, but my students love it. They absolutely think it's amazing. Thank you so much. I think yeah. I think we have it in our, our library. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I sent them an email to ask them to order it, but I haven't checked if it's arrived yet. Yeah. And I don't know if any of my students has checked it out either. <laughs> I think some of them are here. Christine or... Um... Arais, I don't know if I'm saying that your name correctly. Did, do either of you want to want to talk for a minute about your experiences uh, making this art? Hello, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Yes. Hello. Very good, uh, very good uh, pre presentation. <laughs> um, we it was very. It was a very meaningful experience, I think, to work, uh, of course, with COVID being 
very all present at the time uh, to work with something that was so close to the craft by uh, setting type and like trying to inhabit the spirit of Virginia Woolf <laughs> in that way and understanding a text on like not just reading on being ill but working with it in that way I think that was very meaningful for us mm. and like in retrospect looking back at uh, like being out of the pandemic I'm very happy to have worked on a project like this and um, that we were kind of handling the pandemic while also being in the pandemic mm. with this author that is long dead but uh, very present at the same time mm. Thanks, yes, I want to say something else. Hello. <laughs> yeah, it was very, I think also this project brought, brought us together to the, like, the classmates and working to, together in this project during these times was very strong also. And we learn a lot from each other and from Anne. And yeah, I'm super grateful for having the chance to go deeper in her work because for me actually it was the first time reading Virginia Woolf and I was one of those thinking that it was too difficult for me so I'm very happy I had the chance to break those walls somehow yes. Thank you. yeah I love what um looking at one sentence at a time allows for it's really, um, it's really mm. interesting reading experience and I think also it's this, uh, the it's underestimated how funny she is. Yes, this great sense of uh, humor, uh, and I think that maybe should talk more about the, this funny uh, humorous writer. So because I also think it's very strange that she has this rumor of being too difficult, mm. uh, which is such a pity, uh, because then many people miss out. Yeah. Well, Anna, I just wanted to say, um, <laughs> like last year, um, I think uh, your your work and your letterpress work is so amazing, but you are also an incredible writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I love to hear your sentences. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to tell you that. Wow, that's a really, that's a really, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice of you to say. Uh, great. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I never identified as a as a writer. It's uh, something that uh, I really felt like. Yeah, you have to yeah try and make them your allies, uh, which I think everyone uh, that, that do art and design, this is something we all struggle with, uh, like finding our also um, voice in writing because we're mostly kind of talking with what we're doing. Um, so thank you. That means a lot. Catherine. Can I? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. sorry. Go ahead, Catherine. I was just interested in um, in the way that this project highlights interruption, which seems to be such an important thing in Wolf's writing, and you know the way that the pandemic interrupted your projects, and the way that illness interrupts projects and plans and 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 sort of the way that she it seems to me makes that such a powerful thing and I don't my question I guess is just is that could you say more about how that sort of worked out for you and this project for your students uh, interruptions 
Yeah, and and are there, you know, I don't know, I, I think that's so powerful in what you've said. And I wondered if there was more that you have thought about in that in that area. Yeah, I think, yeah, um, uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, because I think this is this project is is about interruption, and also I it interrupted in my life. But then I was also interrupted in my work because then after a while I ha we had to go back to work, and then work interrupted this project. So it was kind of like this interruptions from every, and then kind of also that the attention span uh, that was it's like to keep the attention span through the pandemic was a nightmare. I think we all experienced that. And also like the attention span on Zoom. And then like you have all these meetings and they have like, they don't have any texture or smell or anything, which is, it's kind of done, did very strange things, at least to my way of thinking and being in the world. Um, uh, and I think, um, well, I think when I started this project, I was uh, I, I was a beginner at the li with living at, in a pandemic. I didn't know much about it, um, and I, I felt like one sentence uh, every day, like just to to interrupt uh, also the um, uh, the feeling of days blending into the other, uh, and it was kind of more like setting the time. Like every day was a new sentence. And then every day I kind of stuck with this sentence and thought about that sentence. And uh, so it was kind of, it felt like this calendar. I sometimes feel like this is kind of like a calendar project. Um, but I think also, I don't know, it's, it's almost also the same as having kids, you're constantly interrupted. Uh, so I feel like interruptions is my, is my normal life. Uh, <laughs> Really. Hmm. Claire, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, lovely to see you again, Mona. Um, and another beautiful talk as always. And it's lovely to meet your students. Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to ask you briefly about the idea of daily practice and doing something daily and that kind of um, notion of habit or kind of ritualized practice that then becomes when it accumulates a kind of artistic installation through repetition, because it's something that I've been thinking about pedagogically with my students. I work with a sort of interdisciplinary group of art students, as you know, um, and I've been thinking about trying to get them to try a daily practice as part of our class to choose something that they might sort of show up to every day. And I was just curious to hear more of your reflections on that. I know it's something that other artists also do. And, and I just mm. wanted to know how you, how you feel about that kind of way of measuring time and working. Mm. Um, I will also put a little link in the chat at the risk of self-promotion because I wrote about Anna and her work in, in my new book, Alongside Wolf, where I think she belongs to, to be discussed. So. Thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you for, I uh, just looked at your mail before today about your book and I'm excited to talk more about it. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm very thrilled. Um, about doing a daily practice, I think also to kind of, um, to break it up into you do some something a little bit every day. And then uh, after a while you have kind of built up uh, a body of work. And it's a, it's a quite common uh, artistic method to do like, we were also told like think of your project as salami slices instead of thinking it of like this huge mountain that seems impossible to climb it's like well start with one step and then the next uh, and I think it's also kind of a, a method for not being too stressed out and for coping uh, and also I think it's uh, it's healthy <laughs> to, um, to, and I think, yeah, I, I think everybody should try and do like, you have also these like Inktober on drawing a day that has been going on on Instagram for some, some years. Um, um, uh, and I think it's also interesting because doing the same thing repeatedly, you don't actually do the same thing because it evolves, it changes 
and also the way you think about it changes. Um, <clears throat> and I think forcing my students to do letterpress, it's it's all about repeating. You are kind of it's it's slow, and then you print, and then and then half of it is uh, misspelled, and then you have to do it again. Things fall apart, and you have to start over. And I, I think, and that's also why people want to study uh, in our school because it's very crafts based uh, and to to yeah workshop based and be in the workshop and produce and then go back and then do it again. Um, don't know if Arais and Christina can uh, confirm they're just graduated. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's such a yeah, trial and error mm. to, to print and yes, I, yeah, I don't know what to do. Yeah. It, it's, imp imp it's impossible not <laughs> not to it's like you, you don't get any you have to it, you're kind of forced yes and that's where the magic happens i think <laughs> in this error and when because the technique takes control in the end somehow and i really like that part of printing and i think it's very important also like mm. that the technique it's somehow yeah yeah mm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that different pace of things also could be really useful for students who often have this very kind of pressured understanding of the end of term with all of their essays and all the other things. And so breaking things down into these much smaller units that, mm -hmm. that also show their learning in a different way. I think it, it's a really, really amazing pedagogical tool as well as an artistic tool. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa? Yeah. So I think what I wanted to say is connected to what um, both Catherine and then Claire have also brought up. And uh, but I loved I loved how you structured your talk. I was thinking about as you you know sentence by sentence that you went through, but in between the sentences you talked about your experiences and then your process and then another sentence and then an experience and then a process. And that I started thinking as Catherine was talking that that actually, and as you were talking about it, that that actually reflects your life, the process of your work. And then it also reflects what Claire was just talking about with breaking things down into smaller pieces to make them manageable, but also to make them more productive mm -hmm. and, and, and allow for moments that of uh, recognition maybe that you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, so I don't know that I'm saying anything new, but I just, I really, really loved your talk. I love your work and it's, um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was very, uh, uh, very uh, nice things you said. And I, I think, um, I think that is something that I was drilled doing when I did my PhD because I don't have to write the thesis. I have to deliver work and then reflections. For me to write the reflections at the end, it was absolutely like the worst nightmare I could ever imagine. And it's like when I write, when I work, like things like pop up. Uh, and then, and then if you don't write it down at that moment, it disappears. So I've had like this working writing routine, like just get down what's happening, you know, what's, what is when I read this sentence? What's what, what kind of thoughts? And also that I that I had this a regime where I had to post it online every day, and I tried uh, to make reflections also alongside. And sometimes it was just like it came naturally, but some days I didn't have anything to say. And also because it was, I, I, it was like this sentence is enough. I don't have I don't have the energy. So sometimes it just it comes in abundance and sometimes it's like you're walking in a desert and then you come to the to the to the water hole <laughs> and then you walk again so i think to have this joint reading writing practice uh, at least it it works for me and it's also a very dangerous thing opening books because then you borrow someone else's ideas and then you know <laughs> suddenly a lot of things happen uh, you have no control of what happens when you read books uh, which i think is absolutely magical <laughs> okay go ahead 
Hi. Um, thank you again for your, your presentation and your time. It was amazing. Um, I'm wondering, um, I'm not sure if you've been doing any design work uh, outside of these projects, uh, but I am doing a lot of design work that doesn't involve letterpress printing right now because I have to sort of build my access to these spaces. Um, but uh, I'm wondering how you feel like your letterpress work and your work on Wolf is sort of influencing other graphic design work that you've done and how, how you trace your own resonances with that work in other pieces. And mm -hmm. also <laughs> um, in uh, on BAL, you have marbled paper. First of all, I love the, I love the, the box that you've made. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, but did you marble that or did you um, like purchase that from some other artists? Uh, I actually marbled it uh, for another project that didn't happen. Uh, so I had uh, I have huge amounts of marble paper that I mixed. I wanted to marble with coffee. So it, yeah, it's a strange project, but I felt like this, <laughs> this matched really well. So um, uh, so yes, I marbled it. Um, I can uh, recommend it. Uh, about uh, other design work, uh, I do freelance from time to time. Uh, and I think uh, at least uh, uh, like how I work with typography um, has very much to do with my letterpress practice because I've been spending months just looking at, you know, the space between the letters. So there's like, I'm constantly looking at the in-betweens uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more, uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, sharpened way uh, than before I did my Virginia Woolf projects. But, um, but I think like my, my practice as <coughs> a researcher, and teacher is kind of blending into my work on Virginia Woolf, uh, but it's sometimes it's better to keep it out of the freelance work because yeah, and I need to kind of have different um, uh, different personalities for different things. But but most of the time I try to do as much self initiated work as possible. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I definitely agree about. Um, once you let it press printed, it, it kind of breaks your brain forever. You can't look at words or sentences the same way ever again. You're only <laughs> looking at the spaces first and then, and then the text comes. Definitely. <laughs> I think it's a good practice because I think uh, typography is very important and to have uh, yeah, good structures. Mm. <laughs> Madeline, would you like to say something? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much. It was an incredible experience. Uh, more than a talk, I felt like it was experiencing some art with you. Um, I, I'm really interested in um, the resonances that I found from your work and the, the um, keynote um, by Elsa Hudberg on um, you know, being stuck in an air raid and then reaching out for the creative instincts and that reaching out just feels so connective, even when we're on Zoom, right? Or Instagram, um, it, it seems like there's something reparative or um, life affirming in the midst of, you know, a sort of life annihilating or life threatening um, circumstance. And so, um, it was more of an observation that you don't need to necessarily, you know, say something about it. But to me, it seemed to really like um, a demonstration about what Elsa was saying about the, the, the importance of art and creativity um, to um, sort of reach from inside ourselves across whatever distance um, or lo loss of connection that we're feeling, especially um, during COVID, but I would imagine also during, you know, air raids and, and other kinds of lockdowns. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your, um, your insight on that. Uh, and I absolutely agree. Uh, I think you're, uh, yeah, I think that's 
that's really yeah on point i think that's <clears throat> that's the best thing about art in any art form like music and literature and uh, visual arts anything it's kind of like this way of i don't know try to make sense uh, of uh, like the chaos that uh, that is our lives and uh, what's happening and trying i don't know to distill it into something that that connects us and communicates uh, i think it's extremely important yeah yeah i want i wanted to say of course how marvelous this was and incredible and to go back to what beth said about your writing mm -hmm. about your own your your reflections are those available are you going to publish those or are they within the project or because it is marvelous writing thank you um i haven't i haven't thought about it yet i don't know what to do <laughs> with it uh at this moment now it's uh it's just on instagram uh on like that uh, long feed uh, with all the the posts but um but i have so uh, i have been thinking about collecting them and if i should turn it into a book with, like with the sentences and the reflection just just the posts but yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't gotten to it uh, to it uh, yet, but uh, but I'm definitely going to um, uh, give that uh, a second uh, think through. Mm. <laughs> it's a little bit strange because when you've done a project, and then I feel like I'm so it's like this is an old project now. I'm done with that. So it's like now I'm like thinking about the new projects and yeah, it's it's very easy to just like run along and go ahead like to the next and to the next uh, and forget to kind of, uh, yeah, really wrap things that I've done properly. Um, yeah, it's many, it's, it's so many hats. So maybe I should uh, think about that. Mm. So I'm looking at your Instagram feed and realizing that's all you posted during this time, mm -hmm. right? It's just all the sentences and nothing it's else. Every, every single sentence, nothing else. But I sometimes have right, put other images. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a yeah. total grid. Yeah, <laughs> visually that's really interesting too. Yeah, so republished like, on being uh, on the, <laughs> on my feed. But sometimes yeah. I added other images, like reels. Um, but but if, if, I, if I broke that chain, then I could. It would could then it could be easy to kind of not follow through. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's also like when you make these rules, it also becomes like this competition. And I was very naive in the beginning. I was like, of course, I'm not going to make it through. Now I'm just very, very happy that I didn't choose like, yeah, I'm going to do the novel, you know, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, let's do the waves. <laughs> then I would probably still be down here printing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but still like to have these very rigid rules and I would be very disappointed with myself if I didn't, you know, if I didn't follow up and finish. <clears throat> If we have a minute, can I ask you to talk a little bit about next projects and what you're doing, like what you're thinking about now? Uh, yeah, um, I, yeah. As you know, I was supposed to um, show Kew Gardens uh, this year in Texas, um, and then um, yeah, we're working on trying to make it happen next year, but also um, it requires. Uh, a right uh, kind of gallery space because it's also quite huge. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, the length of Kew Gardens, uh, it's a little bit shorter than the mark on the wall, but not that much. Um, and then uh, I've started because now I've kind of finished uh, the mark on the wall on being ill in Kew Gardens that I decided I would. And then I did uh, blue and green, uh, like extra. 
but I'm planning on um, working on Parallax uh, that um, Virginia Woolf printed by Nancy Cunard in 1925. So that is my next project. Uh, now I'm doing research. I don't I don't know where it's going to where it's going to go or how it's going to end up, but that is the that's the plan for now. Uh, and then we'll see and hope it's not a pandemic or anything that uh, sneaks in another project that uh, <laughs> uh, that I didn't intend to with, with that kind of circumstances. But we'll see. So um, now I'm very interested if anyone has uh, Nancy Cunard uh, information. Uh, I'm uh, I'm in the market. <laughs> Well, it looks like we have uh, only a few minutes left in this panel, but we also might, people might benefit from a, <laughs> from a break, a slightly longer break on this third day of the conference. <laughs> I think I'm just speaking for myself, I'm exhausted. Uh, so if, do people have any other, is there anyone else who'd like to say anything um, before we, Before we end this session. It's been really lovely. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. If I can just shout out um, at the next uh, session, um, there's going to be a panel um, that's called Images, Texts, and Textiles. Leah Mackin, um, who was uh, in this panel really briefly, um, she was one of my little press instructors uh, at Wells College at the Book Art Center there. She's going to be presenting and if, if you're interested in Anne's work, I also think you really appreciate deeply um, Leah's work. Ella Bucknell is also amazing. Um, but Leah is a really accomplished sort of press printer. I think you'd all enjoy that too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, uh, yeah, if you could send me the chat because I haven't had the time sure. to read through and there's yes. some uh, if there's yes. links and stuff, I would uh, love to uh, to check it out. Yeah, I can. But it was a real privilege uh, to be able to present, uh, even uh, though uh, we couldn't meet. And I really hope we can meet in person next year. That would be amazing. Yes, we want to walk through your art. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really hope we can do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we hoped to have dancers perform in your exhibition this year. Right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that was also the plan. And I'm, yeah, and I'm really excited to uh, to read your uh, to read your readings uh, of the uh, yeah of this installation. If not next year, then the year after that. I'm really yeah. Uh, I'm, I think I'm, I'll just stick on to it <laughs> until it happens. Thanks, Anne. Mm. Right, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you.